Merci. because there was a problem on the kernel side. And as, the, you know, as you might notice from the title, this is going to be an introduction to some of the, uh, the techniques that we use on the team to do uh, an analysis on kernels that they encountered programs on live systems. What I want to go through today is tell you what exactly happens when a kernel crashes, what you should prepare to, to do, and I want to talk to you about a couple of tools that uh, might help you do this uh, analysis after you encounter the problem. Let's start with something easy, something uh, which I hope you're more familiar with. Let's assume that we just have a normal application, a normal user space program that crashed. It encountered a problem and it crashed. You need to figure out what happened to that application. Well, there are a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, you can start out by, for example, reading the code. If you're the developer, for example, or you just have access to, to the code, you can start and uh, based on what was the environment of the application when it crashed and your knowledge of the code itself, you may want to uh, go through the code and see if there was a possible uh, problem in the code, uh, fix, that, uh, fix that bug, recompile it, make it work. Uh, may, not, all, uh, not all the time you have this option, you, uh, you might have a big application, you might not want to spend years and years debugging a, a software problem. 
you might want to modify the code to do some, uh, to provide some more information about the application while it's running. You can do some debug messages. And e even though most developers won't like to admit it, the best way to do it is just to put in some printfs in the code and see what are the conditions of the code while it's running. This affects the code, you have to recompile it. Mm, it sometimes uh, can um, modify the application so much that it doesn't give you the right perspective. So you might want to do something else. Usually another uh, a good approach is to use GDB. How many of you are familiar with what GDB does? Yes, thank you. GDB is awesome. You should use it. Developers use it all the time. Why is it awesome? Because it can debug processes either by starting them uh, uh, alongside an application. So you have GDB that starts an application and w w when the process of that application is running, you can uh, introduce uh, uh, breakpoints, uh, see what's the environment at some, um, uh, some life cycle of the process. You can uh, alter uh, the virtual memory of the process. You can do several things with GDB. So uh, one approach is to have that application running. You can attach uh, the GDB to a running process, or you can start the process with GDB, my application, and have a, a GDB attached uh, from the start to that process. But sometimes you want to find out what happened to the application after it crashed. So you want to do a post-mortem analysis. In some situations, the crash of that application, for example, usually in the, in the case of a sec fault, you would get something uh, like a core dump, uh, a file cor uh, called core dump, which is the dump of the virtual memory of that process. What does that mean? If I have access to the virtual memory of the process, it means I have information about the environment of that application at the time of the crash. Based on that, I can gather information about what was going on in the process when or at the moment when it crashed. I can also use GDB on this. I can start GDB on, uh, on an application and also provide it a core dump, which will allow me to, uh, for that application to run in the same way it ran when it encountered the, pro uh, the problem and got the crash. This way, I have a GDB instance of a process which was basically a clone of that initial um, crash process, which I can dissect live and run GDB operations on that application. So these are uh, some of the approaches for debugging an application. If we move into the kernel world, some people will say that things are completely different. We have no idea w what uh, is going on in the kernel, how to debug it, how to do anything. Kernel space is unicorn land. Everything is different. Not so much. Uh, most of the principles still apply you still have most of the same debugging mechanisms. Maybe not printf, you have printk, <coughs> which indeed comes with some other uh, problems because uh, the way that uh, the kernel works, for example, not having a uh, terminal attached, we won't see messages on the console. You would probably see printk generated messages on a serial port, for example. Or, uh, by default, in the DMS, the uh, kernel log buffer. We can look at those uh, messages for more information. We can do um, um, GDB. We can attach GDB to the uh, live kernel. Slightly more complicated, but we can do that. We can also get some information on a live kernel. I would just want to mention system tap, which is also a very interesting uh, a way of debugging things in the kernel. It deserves its own, um, uh, its own presentation. But as you can see, it mostly, we mostly have the same way of thinking about debugging the kernel as we would do most of uh, the application in user space. However, there are some restrictions, and I want to mention what are those restrictions and how we can work around them. That being said, let's talk about what's a kernel crash. So a lot of people said, oh, okay, something happened in the kernel, uh, the kernel crashed. Let's be more specific about what that means. First of all, uh, we should uh, realize what is the severity of a problem in the kernel. For example, we can just have warnings in the kernel buffer in that DMS uh, 
which tells us that something uh, is happening in kernel space. Either uh, uh, the actual kernel or kernel module outputted some uh, information in the kernel DMESC uh, buffer, and those uh, messages could mean something. They can range for just informational warnings to actual errors in the device. These won't <laughs> cause problems in the kernel themselves. They may be problems on the system and the kernel module will tell you that there is a problem, for example, with uh, a disk. You have I.O. errors on the disk. That's a problem. But that's a problem for the disk, for the hardware. It's not a problem for the actual kernel. So from that perspective, everything that we get in the DMS buffer with uh, these print K um, uh, generated messages are informational from the kernel's point of view. Then we have kernel oops. The kernel oops are something specific to kernel space. They're um, uh, a type of problems within the kernel that we usually don't want to see. But what do they mean? Uh, though these are some an, uh, anticipated problems, some specific set of problems that the kernel might encounter, which might cause uh, future problems if the kernel continues run. So the kernel will warn you about these issues and as, as an oops, but that might mean that the kernel it will continue running. So it will continue running with the disclaimer from the kernel that I am now unstable use me at your own risk, and you might want to not continue doing that, you might want to reboot the machine, you might want to troubleshoot what caused that, um, uh, that kernel oops, usually a software issue in either the kernel or most likely a kernel device driver. Sometimes it might uh, have a side effect in the future which will lead uh, to a kernel panic. Or in general the system will just be unstable. Then you have the kernel bugs. Kernel bugs are something that the software developer anticipated. There are situations that uh, the, the kernel developer uh, thought that could happen, but should never happen. So if the kernel reaches that point where the code is in a function, a, a, um, a piece of a function where it shouldn't ever reach, that would be a problem. It's anticipated, so the kernel developer said that, OK, uh, I'm going to track this, but you should never be there. Sometimes that bug uh, is um, uh, it just informational, so you can say, okay, that happened, do something about it, you might have uh, side effects later. But it can also cause, uh, cause a kernel crash, so actually crash the system. And I kept saying kernel crashes and kernel panics. The actual kernel panic is when the system is completely down, is inoperable. It's the point when the kernel reached um, a phase where it's no longer working. You can't do anything on it. Processes are not being scheduled. You can't uh, type in anything on the keyboard. Nothing new will uh, pop into the monitor. Nothing is going to happen. The kernel is in a state where it's still running technically. So uh, it's the only thing on the machine actually existing in RAM, in um, in any way, but it's not actually doing anything. It's frozen. That's a kernel panic. It's the equivalent of um, uh, what we would see in the Windows world, for example, as that blue screen of death. And this is what we wanted to talk about uh, in this presentation. What do we do with these kernel crashes, these kernel panics? When the kernel panics, the, uh, the Linux kernel specifically, wants to help the administrator of the system out. And it does that by providing some information about the kernel panic. So before it draws its last breath, the kernel will print out on the screen on the serial console, it will print out a series of messages. Those will, will be the last thing you will see on the screen before the kernel crashes. The, uh, depending on how the system is configured, the kernel will automatically reboot or not, usually it doesn't, because you want the system administrator to see that last message on screen. And th these messages contain things like, what was the process that caused the panic? What was the state of the registers in, um, uh, on the CPU at the time of the panic? The call trace of the uh, kernel space functions 
which would be the history before the kernel panic. And it looks something like this. For example, at the first line, you would see something uh, like um, unable to handle kernel null pointer dereference. That's the cause of the panic. But, uh, so it would be the equivalent of a, a null pointer dereference in user space, like a sec fold, but not really. Uh, that is something that the system cannot recover from. It panics. So you see the, um, the, um, uh, the reason why it panicked on top. Then you have some more informational messages. For example, what was the kernel version? What modules were linked in? You also get uh, the list of registers. What were the regis hardware register on the system? Uh, what were their state? What were their values? You also get a call trace. You get a, the call trace of functions that were called before it reached that, um, uh, that state to panic. Now, let me give you a bonus uh, tip regarding presentations, not regarding this uh, kernel crash analysis. Uh, if you ever have to do a presentation when you put in uh, a piece of code or text that spans two slides, you're doing it wrong. Don't do that. <laughs> but I actually have a point. Um, here, uh, the, uh, the kernel tries to give you as much information as possible. So it spans out two monitor screens, for example. The problem is that when the kernel panics, everything stops working. For example, you cannot go with page up and see what was the previous screen. So even though the kernel tried to tell you a lot of things, you can't see them. You only see this screen. You would not see the second screen. Unless, for example, you have a serial console and everything outputted by the, uh, the kernel went through a kernel, uh, went to a serial console, and you have that thing locked. But most of the times you don't. So you have information, but you can't access it, so you can't really do anything with it. Or can you? Let's see what we can do about it. Uh, another example would, uh, would be uh, if I have a panic caused by out of memory issues. On top, I see that there is a kernel panic due to out of memory. So that means no more RAM, no more swap, nothing on the system that, uh, that can be allocated. I have to panic. No more memory, I, I need to panic. But it doesn't really show me anything useful in this call trace. It doesn't really show me what caused the, uh, the out of memory. What was the, were the processes that were <coughs> eating up uh, the resources on the system? We need more information. Let's see how we can do that. For example, using a tool um, K, uh, called KDump, we can gather more information. We can prepare the system before a possible crash, prepare the system to be ready to provide us with more information at the moment of the panic. What does KDAM do? It has one role in mind, to generate a VM core. A VM core, just like a normal core dump, is a copy of the memory to a file. So VM core is just a file that is a memory of the running entity. Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, a normal process, it was the virtual memory of the process. In the case of the, uh, of the kernel, it's um, the contents of the RAM plus swap. So everything that the kernel will consider memory. So that's what we want. We want to generate then VM core. Uh, this, um, uh, this tool called KDAM will take care of that. When uh, the kernel panics, so we go through that panic phase, KDAM will start up and uh, copy the contents into, uh, of the RAM and swap into this VM core file and store it uh, on some persistent disk so we can access it later. But there's a problem. KDump is something that needs to be running on the system. But I mentioned earlier that when a uh, kernel crash happens, nothing works on the system. So we need the <coughs> kernel that doesn't do anything because it's in a coma to schedule something like KDump to do the operations of extracting the contents of the memory and dumping it somewhere. So we have a problem. We want to run something and nothing to run it. This is where um, kexec comes in. kexec is awesome in, uh, co uh, concept in the Linux kernel. Just like uh, the name suggests, kexec executes something in the kernel. Kexec, um, it, it's an independent feature from KDump, 
Uh, and it can be used for several features. For example, if you've heard of kexec, probably you've heard of the feature of fast reboot. This means that when you have a running kernel, you do um, a yam or up get uh, update of the kernel um, uh, kernel package, and you want to boot into a new kernel. Uh, kexec can execute the new kernel, the new kernel image from uh, uh, from the disk without having to go through a full reboot, without having to power off the machine, go through POST, go to BIOS, UFI, uh, read from the master boot tracker, etc. It just has the old kernel executing a new kernel. So th that's what KXEC does. It executes a new executable, let's say, in the kernel. Not to be confused with uh, KGraft and KSplice, which is a mechanism of live patching, meaning that you have one kernel running and um, subsequently, you replace the running image with another uh, image's code, another kernel's code, live. This uh, kexec actually executes a new image. How can I do that? Well, I have to have the new image somewhere stored. I need to have the image which I'm about to execute stored somewhere. And since I can't store it on disk to use it later because operations on disk need uh, processing from the kernel, I need the code to be there uh, just when I'm about to execute. That means that it has to be in RAM. It has to be in the physical memory when I want to execute it anytime in the future. So to run kexec on a new image, I have to reserve a piece of the physical memory just to store an image which I'm going to later on execute with kexec. So to run, uh, to run this, I'm going to pre-allocate at boot time, at, uh, when the kernel loads, I will uh, tell the kernel to always reserve a certain portion of the RAM to be used by nothing else, and something in the future will populate that, um, uh, that piece of memory, of physical memory, with some, a binary image, which KXEP will be able to execute when it needs to. So using KXEP, KDump, Pro, uh, you, um, provisions this um, uh, piece of uh, physical memory with a kdump kernel image which will be used to do the things we discussed, to uh, copy the contents of RAM and put them on a disk or a network location. I need to do this, I, I need to reserve that uh, memory region by passing the crash kernel parameter to the kernel at boot time. This would mean that the bootloader needs to pass to the kernel this parameter. And kdump knows of that reserved region and will put in that region the needed binary. Small disclaimer, it's not necessarily a new kernel image, it can be the old kernel image, but a new RAMFS, but details. Uh, just think of it as a new kernel uh, running, a special kernel just for KDump. You have the running kernel and you have the special KDump kernel which only does the two things that w w we care about. Uh, copying the contents of the memory and storing it somewhere. Okay, so we have uh, um, KDump configured. This will tell the kernel when it panics, meaning that uh, it does everything that the kernel should do on panic time, for example, print out those messages on screen, just before it th does the last thing, which is do nothing and stay there on the screen. Um, the kernel will do a kexec on this memory region, which contains the kdump kernel. Thus, we're going to have a new running kernel on the system. We're going to have a new image doing something else. Everything that was in the RAM at the time of the crash is still there. Nothing cleared it. The old kernel did not do uh, clearing of the RAM. I didn't power off anything, so I didn't lose the content. I just ran a new kernel there, and everything else remains. <laughs> Meaning that I can, copy the VM, uh, I can copy the content into this VM core. So the KDump image will take care of this. We'll, it will just take the contents of the RAM and swap, if we, need, uh, if we need to, and store them on a file. That file can be, for example, on a partition on the disk. It can, mount, um, it, it can be on the root FS, not recommended. It can be on a separate uh, a partition or LV, and even uh, can do network copy. So either uh, a secure copy or NFS, or actually use iSCSI 
to copy the VM core over the network into another system. But at, at the end, uh, KDAM managed to copy everything and store it in a place where we can do a post-mortem analysis. <coughs> now, how much does this uh, VM core occupy? Well, in theory, it's the size of the RAM plus the size of the swap. Let's just say it's the size of the, the RAM uh, for generic purposes. That might be a big file. So, for example, if we're on a server that has 128 GB bytes of RAM, uh, it's going to have 128 um, uh, GB bytes of stored file, uh, of, of uh, stored data on the file. That might be big. But sometimes we don't need to store everything. For example, uh, we don't need to store the contents of the user space, uh, the virtual memory, user space virtual memory of the process. We, if we do kernel debugging, we don't need to uh, know what was going on in the application um, running on the system. So we can zero those out. And actually, we want to do that because uh, it's a matter of uh, privacy. For example, uh, if um, Red Hat customers send us a VM core of their system, uh, they need to trust us that we're not going to access private data for their company. So what we do, we actually zero out, uh, or we recommend uh, the client to set up KDAP in such a way that they zero out all the information that has nothing to do with the actual kernel. So in the end, we're going to have an image of mostly zeros, which can be compressed. So we have a big image, but if we uh, run a compression algorithm on it, we can reduce the, the size of that VM core to um, a very uh, small number, like a couple of gigabytes. So we have the VM core. We can do analysis on the VM core and see what was going on on the system at the time of the crash. What do we use to do that? There's this utility called crash. Crash um, is something that we would run on our system or on the system that crashed after the reboot to analyze that VM core that was generated. Crash is actually based on GDB. So it uses uh, in the background GDB. This means that you, uh, you, if you know GDB, you could be uh, quite familiar with what the uh, uh, crash looks like. Um, it, you have some of the same uh, uh, workflows. You have some of the same features. You can have plugins, for example, like in GDB. Um, so you take advantage of what GDB does, plus uh, kernel-specific things on top. It requires as input, of course, the VM core to see what was the state of the system at the time, but it also requires the original um, kernel image, kernel binary, just like GDB would do on a normal application. When you start post-mortem an application, with, uh, you want to, redo, um, to rewind uh, the, an application crash if you have the core dump, you do GDB, my application, and the core down. Same thing with crash. You run crash with the kernel image. It has to be the same kernel image as the one on, in the VM core. And then the actual VM core. What you get is an environment where you have the same things on, in the crash session as you would have on the real system at the time of the crash. So, for example, you can uh, access logs. You can access the demask buffer because the uh, kernel log buffer was in RAM at the time of the crash. Therefore, it was it is going to be in the VM core. You can access it, so you can get more uh, more information. You can see the entire history of the kernel, all the logs, without having to go with page up on the screen. We also have uh, access to all the data structures of the kernel. So everything from file systems to uh, processes to network connections, everything that was in RAM and used by the kernel, you have access to it uh, then. You can have uh, uh, some tools built into, um, uh, uh, in, into Crash, for example, PS. You, crash contains PS, a uh, command that will uh, give you a similar uh, output as PS in user space. It's not going to have all the features of a normal PS, but it will have just enough information for you to figure out what was running on the system. Or you can uh, get, you have some um, built-in uh, uh, commands to get information about memory. You can access the mount to see the mount points at the time of the crash. If there isn't something specific uh, that uh, exists as a commanding crash, you can always try to dissect the actual structures. You can 
uh, have um, uh, pointers in memory, you can say that that pointer in memory represents, for example, a file struct. And you can read the contents of that uh, structure as it was at the moment of the crash by casting it to a struct file. So you can do the, um, uh, the debug, uh, as uh, detailed debugging as you want in this crash session um, if you have all the contents of the RAM. For example, um, uh, what you can do uh, very easy and something uh, that we, uh, we do all the time, out of memory debugging. So we saw on the, on the screen earlier that uh, there was uh, uh, that uh, crash that was caused by out of memory issues. So we uh, know that something was occupying the RAM, but we don't know what. In, um, in a normal system, you have the OOM killer that will try to kill some processes that uh, consume RAM to free up more RAM, but at some point, uh, if uh, OOM killer cannot cope with the amount of uh, memory being used, it's going to uh, give up and let the, the kernel panic. You're going to see, uh, on the panic message, you're going to see that one specific process failed allocating memory and that ultimately caused the kernel panic. But it does not mean that that specific process which uh, was running the panic function was the one occupying the most memory. So you want to see what was occupying the memory. So what you can use, for example, in um, uh, there's a built-in command in crash uh, run kmem, and see, for example, what was the usage of RAM uh, swap, just like uh, a similar output as uh, free, formatted in other way. You can, uh, and with the output of uh, kmem, you, for example, will see if indeed all the swap was used and all of the RAM was used, indeed, if it was an out-of-memory issue. Then you can do, um, uh, you can run PS. Sorry? Uh, yes? Will it do also the amount of memory of specific kernel structures inside of the kernel? Or just the user space? The KMAP uh, command? Uh, so so uh, to figure out what were the structures used by, by the I kernel? Mean, uh, because you have, you have some memory which is allocated by the kernel for kernel uh, stuff. And you yes. Have I honestly don't remember. I think you can do, uh, get that information, but I, I, I really don't, don't know the answer. We can see, uh, we can try to, uh, to run the output. Hmm? Somebody knows? No. Um, but usually the, uh, the uh, amount of memory occupied by kernel structures is in, uh, infamously smaller compared to the user paid data. Well, Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you would then have to dig into uh, all the information about the slab, uh, and you can access that information. So you can, uh, probably not with this specific command. But uh, in the end, yes, you would be able to get all that information um, there. It depends how, how deep you want to, to dig. So um, back to, uh, P um, to Crash, you have uh, the option of running PS and see... Um, which process, so process ID with process name, um, all the information you would have with the normal PS. See which process or thread were using uh, the physical memory. Also, you would have the virtual memory of each process. Lockups. You would have a problem where uh, you, uh, the, where the system uh, freezed because uh, uh, there was a resource being used by several uh, processors. You can end up in a deadlock situation where all of the, um, uh, the CPUs were stuck on an instruction and no new tasks were able to, uh, to be scheduled on those CPUs. Uh, the generic uh, deadlock up situation. Uh, for example, you can, uh, uh, in a VM core, you can run a BT, a backtrace of all the process uh, of those CPUs to see what processes uh, were running on the CPU on what kernel function they were stuck on, and uh, if, for example, all the <coughs> CPUs are stu stuck on a spin lock, you would be able to see what was that spin lock which was keeping all of the processes, uh, all of the CPUs occupied. 
to, you would be able to uh, to determine what was the the common resource that caused the lockup. Um, there are several things you can do with uh, uh, with crash. Uh, I, I just gave, gave uh, two uh, two examples. Um, we also have some um, specific uh, plugins to test uh, for issues, for example, with the file system. If uh, um, the file system uh, was uh, frozen and somebody tried to access that file system, you, uh, with those uh, plugins, you can build up some specific uh, tests and try to see if um, uh, at the time of the crash some specific things were happening on the machine, test for them, and see if it matches some known use case. But uh, these were just uh, a couple of the examples of how you would ordinarily uh, try to uh, use Crash to debug some very basic things in the kernel. What I wanted to share with you today is that you need to be prepared for these kinds of, um, um, of crashes. KDump is not enabled by default. In, uh, in some newer distributions, uh, it comes as an option to be installed by default, but you still need to activate it. You still need to reserve that memory space for the RAM because it costs you. It depends on uh, 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 if you find it useful to have a specific uh, region of uh, memory allocated constantly in RAM. So you have to configure it yourself. But if you do have KDAP configured, at least you will have the option of doing the analysis post-mortem, so uh, you will be able to gather more information after the system has been rebooted and restored into production. Also, once you have that, um, um, that uh, VM core, you have tools like Crash to analyze the VM core and get some useful information about the system without having to live debug the problem. Install KDump. If you're running a, a production server, we highly recommend it. The, the, half, half of our, uh, of our cases, uh, we basically say, please install um, KDump. It will be useful for you in the future if you're running this uh, RHEL system in production. Uh, if you have any questions... Uh, is it, is it I'm running system performance. Well, let me ask you this. Is it running while uh, it's um, uh, in, uh, in the uh, system is in production? Nothing's running uh, before the actual panic. So, except that uh, piece of memory, of physical memory that you have to reserve to be there in case you want to execute it, nothing's actually running. So, it, it doesn't impact performance because you have something else running on the system. How big is this portion of memory? Uh, it depends. Um, it, talking about kilobytes, gigabytes, uh, For example, if you have, uh, I'm not specific, I don't know the number specifically, but rough estimate, if you have, for example, a gigabyte of RAM, uh, 100 gigabyte of RAM, maybe you want to reserve 200 megabytes for uh, for the crash kernel parameter. This is needed because um, uh, usually to do the copying, to uh, to have all all the space to run operations like uh, copy, compress, copy over the network, or copy over a local disk. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah. ah, sorry. Anything else? Ah, I need to hand over a scarf, right? Uh, can, you, uh, you, you, can you come after? Uh, yes? So how about the default uh, compiler optimization? Do they allow to like some reasonable debugging after a crash? Well, you will need the... Um, uh, oh, when you run crash, you will need to run <coughs> the image on a debug kernel. So uh, not a kernel compiled with the debug options, but the kernel combined with, for example, the, the symbols. Okay. So not a strict kernel. Okay? There was... Yeah, uh, so how do you think about when your running handler actually crashes again? So when you're entering the running handler and the kernel crashes there? It can happen that you, you have the, uh, the K dump while it's running having some issues and panic itself. Right. Yes. So we get kind of 
Yeah, yeah you, you, you won't have a K dump for K dump. So it just changes like how the fish fire? Uh, uh, like well, everything boom? Yes. <laughs> in short, yes. Uh, there, there are situations where, um, for example, in cluster environments, or you have the, the running system that it crashed, and you have fencing mechanisms by other cluster nodes, meaning um, that the node that crashed needs to uh, surely be taken out of the system, so an entity um, powers off the machine. So if that happens, while kdump is copying the data, you won't have the VM core, or at least not a complete VM core. So yeah. is it recommended to run another kernel as the kdump kernel then? So uh, not run into the same issues? Well, you, you would run into the same it. issues. So uh, the, uh, in reality, the kdump kernel is actually the, the same kernel. Okay. It just has a limited set of tools there in the init ROM. So it's the same as a normal kernel ha would have things in the init ROM FS image. So you okay. don't use another kernel version? Techni no, no. It, it, you could, but in practice you don't. Okay, so it's the same kernel image for the KDAM kernel. Just say the memory or why? Oh, why bother with uh, maintaining a, a different separate kernel? when you can use the same one. Well, because you have a different set of blocks in that other kernel. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have the data kernel, you won't crash there. And newer kernels are always better. OK, I think we're running out of time. Um, I, uh, I left some, uh, uh, some links to the, um, uh, in the presentation. First is uh, for the feature in, um, in the Linux kernel, the KDAM feature. Uh, the second is the white paper regarding crash. So it's actually an, a rather old tool, but the, um, it explains how, um, uh, how it's made. Uh, for, uh, our, for Red Hat customers, we have some uh, specific articles on how um, we, uh, we recommend KDAM being set up. And we actually have a, a small script that um, uh, prepares the environment for KDAM. You just uh, go to the customer portal, you uh, do, run through a, a wizard in the web interface, it generates a script, you download the script, you run the script, you have KDAM working. So it takes you three seconds instead of uh, one minute. Uh, be, be, because uh, you don't want all the time to reserve that kernel, uh, uh, that memory region. It might be impacting on the, the system. I would recommend everybody to have it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, you'll find the slide. If you want, you'll find the slides there. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Yes, uh, people with scarves. So, this is about the documentation for kernel uh, configuration on your uh, portal. Uh, actually, for uh, Red Hat 7, it is still out there. Is there any possibility? No, no it's still it's there. The internet? No. Uh, ah, no, so, so it, it, it's, a, it's available for... Uh, so this, this link is only for uh, people who have Red Hat subscription. Yeah, I, I got it, but, but I couldn't, actually couldn't find it for Red Hat 7. Uh, that is what uh, give me just a second. I'll um... just, we just create a new ticket for the Red Hat and they and the server sent us uh, links, but only for the six and the five. I'm there pre was no information about seven. I'm uh, almost positive that there is for seven. Uh, ah, well, never mind. I'm uh, by my own. I'll uh, I'll check it now. Actually, I need to get internet. Uh, no, something is wrong. Is not coming? By the way, in the middle time. Uh, how can you k k generate the VM, co VM core uh, on a working system without any crash?
Well, you couldn't because only sending a whole a whole C to the uh, process. Uh, 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 let me find that uh, um, so I can uh, unplug and leave the next presenter. Actually, without crashing the system. Ah, yes. Ah, that, 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 because yes, I, because I, I just generate a crash and then send it. Okay, I have to export them from Google Docs. Just, ah, that's awesome. <laughs> just only dump, dumping of the memory. Ah, okay. uh, uh, PDF? I just generated the, the, the crash, so uh, I will send it to this for, for the rest of it. Just, just Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'd rather. I actually like uh, giving out presentation. I like uh, talking about the things that I do and like. So, <laughs> thank you. So, KDAM helper. Back to KDAM helper. But, uh, who asked about KDAM on Rail 7? What? Somebody asked about KDAM on Rail 7. Uh, I don't know who yeah, Damn, yeah. it's there. <laughs> it has options. Okay. Okay, both. Yes, I... Uh, může to být teda takhle? Uh, prezenter máme tady, ty si chceš teda. Já mám se rád čekat na to, já se to nějak. Jo, jo. Kdyby to, to bylo třeba tady. Uh, ne? Ne, jsme si natáhnout kabel, ale jinak to je. Já se někdy. Já se skrčím teda. A ten prezenter dělá něco. No, no, minimálně se dá posouvat jako dopředu dozadu, jako chybky, že jo? Můžeš to vyšít a připíhnout do USBčka, tak jo.